Okay. Good evening, good afternoon, or good morning, wherever you are in the world. Okay. Good evening, good afternoon, or good morning, wherever you are in the world. Welcome to our online conference today. Before giving the floor to our dear guest, I want to introduce our team. I will be the moderator of today's conference. My name is Edwin Vasile. Currently, I'm working as a neurosurgeon in Varna, Bulgaria. These online education meetings have started with Professor Hassan Kamil Sujo, the program manager of the neurosurgery department of Izmir Ataturk Training and Research Hospital, and goes on with the contributions of all the residents also with the contributions of the neurosurgeons who graduated from the same department, also neurosurgeons and neurosurgery residents from nearby countries like Pakistan, Georgia, and Bulgaria like me. I kindly ask you to keep your microphones turned off during the presentation of the lecture to avoid voice and noise pollution. You can ask your questions not by turning on your microphones, but by writing to the chat part of the Zoom program. At the end of the presentation, your questions will be asked to the lecturer and will be discussed. Mutual discussion is not appropriate for the format of our meetings. Please do not ask for your microphone to be turned on. Now I will try to introduce Professor Muharrem Yazaja. He has almost countless publications and numerous awards. He is one of the most prolific experts in spine surgery. It is my privilege to present our lecturer, Professor Muharrem Yazaja. Currently, his position is director in the Center of Children's Orthopedics and Spine in Ankara, Turkey. He has finished medical school in Ankara University Faculty of Medicine in 1987. He had special training as a resident in orthopedics and traumatology between 1986 and 1992 in Hajetem University Faculty of Medicine and as a Spine Research Fellowship between 1994 and 1995 in University of Kansas Medical Center with Professor Mark Asher. He, had, he has scientific academic positions he, held. He has been until 2019 Professor of Orthopedic Surgery in Hacettepe University of Faculty of Medicine, Ankara, Turkey. He has been President of Turkish Society of Pediatric, Pediatric Orthopedics between 2008 and 2010, and past president of Scoliosis Research Society between 2020 and 2021, 21st year. He has been president between 2012 and 2013 in European Pediatric Orthopedic Society. He has received numerous awards in the field of orthopedic and pediatric orthopedics. He is board member and reviewer in Journal of Turkish Spine, Su Spinal Surgery, Acta Orthopedica and Traumatologica Turcica, Joint Diseases and Related Surgery, Turkish Journal of Trauma and Emergency Surgery. He has more than 156 scientific papers published. He is editor in two textbooks, Growing Spine and Non-Idiopathic Spine Deformities in Young ch Children. He has been invited in more than 174 lectures and conferences in international meetings. Please, Professor Yazaja, you can start your lecture now. Thank you, Edwin. Can you see my screen? Yes, yes, perfect. Great. Thank you for this kind invitation first. Uh, as Edwin says, good evening, good afternoon, even good morning wherever you are. Uh, I'm very proud and happy to be invited once again to Izmir Neurosurgery Online Neurosurgery Webinar Series. I would like to thank uh, the team led by Dr. Hassan Kamil Sunchu for giving me this opportunity. As you may know, uh, this conference was originally scheduled six weeks ago. However, we had to postpone it due to earthquake disaster that shook our country deeply. We lost thousands of lives. Our beautiful cities were in ruins. Uh, one side of us has been destroyed, but the other side continues to read, write, and speak. Life goes on and has to. That's why we continue where we left off today. This evening, 
Uh, I'll try to summarize the current approach to the treatment principles of congenital spinal deformities in pediatric age group with case examples. I must warn you in advance that not every solution or option of this presentation is based on very strong scientific evidence. I try to prepare a talk by blending my almost 30 years of experience with literature support. I'll also be happy to hear your contributions or, and questions in the Q&A sections after this talk. Okay, I have nothing to disclose. In congenital spinal deformities, there is an imbalance in longitudinal growth of the vertebral column, resulting in progressive deformities and impaired trunk balance. It's almost always accompanied by serious cosmetic problems. There is a high probability of neurologic deficit at the time of presentation or there is a risk of encountering neurologic problems, especially in the sagittal plane deformities, namely kyphosis. Correction of these mostly complex, progressive, and rigid curves poses serious difficulties and risks. For this reason, the approach of preventing the progression of congenital curves instead of correcting them was a preferred uh, as the safest method in the past. Undoubtedly, in March uh, 23, as in the past, we are not just resigning to our destiny. We are wanting for and applying more. This talk will essentially be a brief summary of these applications. Before moving on to the, on to the problems and solutions, I would like to remind you two, three important key points about the basic principles. Number one, there is no standard treatment protocol like a cookbook that can be applied every congenital patient. Number two, there is no specific age for treatment. The age of patient should be taken into account when determining the treatment method to be applied in the patient who needs treatment. Not all congenital deformities needs to be treated. However, if treatment is required, the method should be surgical. I'd like to share two patients from my personal series with you. I had seen the patient on the left hand side for the first time when he was five or six years old and was followed up for multiple pebble bone type spinal deformities involving the spine uh, from top to bottom, entire spinal column. All the spinal column remain short for almost 10 years, alignment remain intact in both coronal and sagittal planes, therefore no treatment required, was required. The other patients in right-hand side is 35-year-old female. She incidentally learned that she had congenital scoliosis by chance on the X-ray taken in the emergency room when she went to uh, the ER department with urinary symptoms. She didn't need a treatment until that day. And after that day, she will not be for this reason. Maybe she has, she may need limited decompression due to congenital stenosis in the future. In summary, treatment approach approaches should be individualized in cases with congenital deformity, deformity type and localization, patient age and severity of deformity should always be considered in decision-making. Although we have said that 
the treatment is almost always surgical, conservative treatment can be used in very limited indications, especially for compensatory curves or as a time buying uh, strategy in very young children. Above, you see a congenital case with which compensatory curve was tried to be controlled with the brace. And below is a good example of a buying time with serial casting under the general anesthesia for significant lumbar curve accompanying thoracic congenital deformity. We published our casting results in Journal of Pediatric Orthopedics as time buying strategy in congenital spinal deformities. In one of our patients from the series, we were able to, to delay the surgical treatment for about four years with a brace and then a meta cast, which was repeated five times. The later we start the growing road application, the less likely we are encounter, to encounter complications. The patient is still uh, being followed with growing rods. The most important factors in determining the surgical treatment pr protocol uh, strategy to be preferred in different age group groups are the patient's age and growth potential of the spine. While we generally prefer methods aiming to preserve growth in early onset scoliosis, our surgical approach in the adolescent age group is almost always complemented uh, by definitive fusion. The number of vertebrae included in the deformity is a very important determinant in the treatment planning of early childhood deformities. For short segment deformities, Resection doesn't cause growth disturbance and often provides lifelong long treatment. Growth-friendly approaches should be preferred in sweeping, long sweeping deformities involving as more than five segments, where resection will cause significant growth arrest. Among these treatments, Classical or instrumented convex growth arrest, growing growth, or expansion teracoplasty stand out. Hemivertebrectomy. One of the other, my favorite procedure is currently accepted as a state of the art approach. With complete resection, the deformity can be managed perfectly. In the past, it was used in children only older than five years old age. This is the patient of my personal series, a 14-year-old male patient. It's a nice correction, all three planes. Today, procedure can be applied safely and effectively from the age of two years. This is a two-year-old girl from the last month with interventions made before the deformity reaches significant size, it may be possible to achieve full correction by including only one segment in the operation. In the late cases, the instrumentation limit inevitably expands. This both increases long-term morbidity and causes negative effects on spinal column growth. A single hemivertebrae can be removed with hemivertebrectomy or two consecutive hemis can be removed simultaneously by preserving or sacrificing the root in between. Also, this is the last uh, month, we removed two consecutive hemivertebrae uh, upper thoracic hemivertebrae in this little girl. We sacrificed the T6 root on the convex side. We didn't, wouldn't touch the T3 hemi because it is not contributing significantly the deformity. Removal of sagittally localized hemivertebrae also allows full decompression uh, of the spinal cord. Existing neurologic symptoms can be improved 
by this way. Some children with hemivertebrae have compensatory curves of much larger size accompanied by local deformity. Correcting only deformity in these doesn't solve the problem. Cons compensatory cur curve also needs to be managed. In these circumstances, combining hemivertebrectomy with growing growth appears to be a good option. An example of this application is the patient. Hemivertebrectomy was performed in that surgery after the, a lengthening period of seven years, she graduated with reinstrumentation and fusion. Another example, in this patient, we removed lumbar hemivertebrae at the index surgery. After an eight year lengthening period, he graduated without any final surgery as the alignment in both sagittal and coronal plane was good and the implants were intact. In cases where spinal alignment is achieved with hemivertebrectomy, can this improvement be maintained for life? This is a very critical question. Is this procedure really a guaranteed lifetime undertaken? In many cases, the answer is yes. Alignment, like this patient, alignment is excellent in post-operative seventh, uh, seventh and post-manarchy second year, and we don't expect it to worsen in the following years. But another example, alignment maintained for 10 years, but the then deteriorated during the pre-adolescent growth spot period. And now we plan to extend her instrumentation in the near future. That's why pre-adolescent period is really risky in terms of progression. Another patient, everything about the spine was perfect for, for 10 years after double hemivertebrectomy. We performed the hemivertebrectomy in the age of four and 10 years, everything is fine. But with adolescence, things deteriorated and instrumentation had to be extended proximally. Another very similar scenario, thoracolumbar hemivertebrae, which was excluded from instrumentation, initial instrumentation because it didn't contribute significantly to the deformity during index surgery, but caused a serious problem as it progressed in adolescence. During the revision, this hemivertebrae, this one was also removed and instrumented, instrumentation was extended proximally. At this point, to make a brief summary about hemivertebrectomy, it can be safely performed from the age of two. Some surgeons even perform in the age of one. I prefer two. The instrumentation limit is related to deformity size. Deformities shouldn't be allowed to progress. It can be combined with growth-friendly technique if it is necessary, but all patients, including those with perfect correction should be followed closely into adulthood. Okay, another page. If the congenital anomaly includes a long segment and if resection is going to lead to a significant morbidity, if it, it will result in serious trunk shortening, okay? The recommended approach for those patients in the 70s was convex growth arrest. In Hajetepe, we also have an extensive experience with the methods. We have achieved truly a miraculous results in some patients. However, it was not possible to control deformity in some. Unpredictability was the most important issue. To eliminate 
uh, do, to overcome this uh, the problem, we eliminated anterior surgery by modifying the method in Hajjatepe in the 90s. Using pedicle screw, we were able to achieve both acute correction and further improvement in the follow-ups in according with the hutter waltman principles. However, this method, method was not sufficient in some patients. We modified the first modification and combined it with the growing rod in cases where the deformity was severe at the time of presentation or the trunk balance was impaired or the compensatory curves were noticeable. Excellent coronal and sagittal alignment at say eight years follow-up. We often use a combination convex growth arrest and magic and magnetically controlled growing growth nowadays. One of our graduate patients. Another patient with accompanying intraspinal pathology. We graduated her at the age of 14. We have reported our experimental and clinical results regarding the method with numerous uh, papers and numerous studies. Despite the congenital anomaly, we still use traditional or magnetic growing rod in cases where the deformity has very similar features in idiopathic scoliosis globally. One of our TGR traditional growing rod graduates. Although the instrumented curve is mostly, most of the time successfully controlled during the growing rod treatment process, adding on deformities uh, may develop from time to time. We also have an experience with three-column osteotomy and alignment restoration uh, during definitive surgery in these patients. One of our congenital EOS patients from this series. In graduation, we were able to achieve a good alignment in all three planes by performing uh, asymmetric pedicle subtraction osteotomy at lower instrumented vertebrae and extended the instrumentation distally. A significant proportion of the congenital patients um, also thoracic abnormalities. Rib aplasia and fusions restricts the thorax, restrict the thorax, reduced respiratory capacity, and adversely affect the lung growth. If left untreated, serious cardiopulmonary uh, problems and premature, even premature death are inevitable. In these patients, by expanding the thorax, both the lungs are freed for function, uh, bo both the lungs are freed for function and development and spinal deformity is indirectly corrected. The short-term radiological results of the vector and expansion thoracoplasty technique developed by Bob Campbell, late Bob Campbell, for thoracic insufficiency are promising. And this, you can find significant evidence uh, in the, from the literature, a significant thoracic height gain and deformity control. In the early postoperative period, the thorax and thus the lung volume can be increased with this technique. However, it has been shown that this instrumentation, which bypasses the thorax, reduces chest compliance and thus doesn't provide the expected long-term improvement in respiratory function. In my personal experience, although, I'm sorry, uh, we were able to increase lung volume and reduce the respiratory support in children in short-term follow-up with the technique, we failed in the long-term deformity control. I would like to draw your attention to the rib pump. Another patient from this group, 
the root cages appear pretty symmetrical. Deformity in the coronal plane is under control, but again, serious repump development draws attention. How can we explain this? I think explanation is in the slides. Although the spine was not directly involved, the Phyllis Schreiner's team demonstrated spontaneous fusion of the spine after repeated disjection of the thorax. The Basel group also reported new bone formation around the implants in the thorax. This is, this is our experience as well. In our evaluation with CT during preoperative and graduation period, we observed that spontaneous spinal fusion develop in our expansion thoracoplasty patients. And this fusion probably triggered a crankshaft-like process. Currently, we use Vector only in cases where the thorax is severely constricted. Uh, we don't use it for spinal, only spinal deformity treatment. As for adolescent deformities, I think it is easier for us to make a decision in this group that has completed spinal growth. We can now focus on how to correct the deformity in most effective and safest way. We don't need to be worried about growth retardation. The only thing that differs from the idiopathic, like the idiopathic deformities in the management of this so-called idiopathic or idiopathic-like deformity is the need to routinely perform posterior column osteotomy at multiple levels. We should also accept that the amount of correction will be less modest than modern AIS surgery. Another patient from the same age group, same technique, posterior instrumentation, posterior column osteotomies, very similar results. In patients with congenital rib anomalies or very rigid spine deformities, the correction capability uh, can be increased by adding concave rib osteotomies to the posterior column osteotomy. You can see only from posterior instrumentation with the help of posterior column and the rib osteotomies, we can get nice correction in both coronal and sagittal plane. With this relatively another patient, only a posterior instrumentation and posterior column and the rib osteotomy. With, with this relatively safe method, the deformity can be moderately corrected in most patients without need for three column osteotomies. Okay, another interesting topic. We know that a significant number of the congenital scoliosis is accompanied by intraspinal pathologies. We all know that there is no consensus on the management of these intraspinal pathologies. While in the past, it was recommended that all pathologies, whether symptomatic or not, be treated before deformity surgery. Now, a group of surgeons seems to have adopted the approach of not touching almost any of them today. Pendulum swing one side, the other side. This topic could, could, could be a lecture by itself. I will not go into too much detail in this general deformity talk. To summarize our approach briefly, we developed in Hajat Tepe again, with the help of Professor Manajat Akalan, we use the PAN classification. We don't consider any intraspinal procedure in type two patients. In type one, if the pathology is within uh, the our limit of instrumentation, limit of our instrumentation, uh, we first address the spinal cord pathology and then correct the deformity. If the cord pathology is beyond our surgical margins, above and below, 
we seek a solution to deformity without intervening, so neurosurgical intervening. Two examples outlining this approach, similar adolescent deformities. In a bow case, only deformity surgery uh, was performed. This is a type two split cord malformation, but in this case, in the below, um, first, our neurosurgical colleagues excise the spur and, and simultaneously, see, uh, after the neurosurgical procedure is done, uh, we followed by right, deformity surgery in the same session. In, co in cases, uh, yeah, this is the case. <clears throat> now, it's another topic. Uh, vertebral column resection. As you know, there are many types of the vertebral column resection procedure has been described. In cases requiring resection, the bone cut should be done according to pathology type. In this very simple posterior hemivertebrae cases, posterior pedicle subtraction osteotomy may be enough. With a bone disc, bone type resection, it is possible to both correct deformity and decompress the cord in this case. For three planar deformities, vertebral column resections seems to be most ideal approach. Today, we do all the resection from the back. However, in the past, we have also done two stage operations. I can clearly say that there is no significant difference between uh, the results. We cannot claim that VCR is very simple, very easy and risk-free procedure. However, it's possible to achieve very successful results with meticulous preoperative planning, good monitoring and experience team. Besides achieving perfect alignment, circumferential decompression of the cord is a great advantage of the technique, especially for kyphotic congenital uh, cases. How about the age? Vertebral column resection can theoretically be done at any age. The technique requires a very rigid fixation as it disrupts spinal column continuity. This means at least five or six vertebral segments must be included in the fusion. While planning VCR in young children, it's necessary to evaluate um, the deformity globally. While controlling the progressive deformity, on the other hand, it is necessary not to seriously harm the growth potential. Two examples of this approach, carbon copy patients. One is five, another one is 14 years old. Upper thoracic curve was managed vertebral column resection in both. While the problems was completely resolved by including lower thoracic uh, segments in the instrumentation in this patient, the brace treatment was deemed appropriate for lower curve in order not to prevent the trunk growth in young patients. Same deformity. So, same deformity, similar size uh, pathologies, but and completely different uh, approach because of age. Halo gravity traction. I would like to briefly touch about it. This is one of the oldest methods in our hands. In the past, we were using it uh, very frequently, and then it lost the popularity, but now it's regained again. Although VCR has become a standard procedure today, halo gravity traction 
has not lost its popularity in popularity. In very severe complex deformities that cannot be corrected with single VCR, vertebral column resection, stretching of the curve with preoperative hydrogravity traction increases the safety of spinal surgery. We performed hydrogravity traction in this adolescent girl who presented with a very severe and rigid double thoracic uh, curve. We are gradually increasing the traction weight with the, this household traction kit. She is now at four weeks and we have reached almost 40% of her body weight. We already have a serious improvement, significant improvement in both planes. We plan to complete the treatment with posterior instrumented fusion combined with the PCO and ribosteotomies about in the two or three weeks. So, so far, I've made some suggestion on what to do, when, and in what situations. We all know, well, that is very important to know what not to do in surgery. A wrong decision or erroneous application at the beginning can lead us to very undesirable situation. If the first is incorrectly buttoned, the other buttons on the shirt will also be. The story began by deciding to remove an innocent hemivertebrae of a one-year-old child. At every step, after that, the mistake was repeated, getting bigger and bigger. After five years, six major surgical interventions and catastrophic spinal, before development of catastrophic spinal deformity. Fortunately, the child is still alive and neurologically intact. At this stage, we are included in the treatment now we seem to have alleviated the problem for now with surgery. We perform at the age of six plus five, but we still have a long way to go and other problems are probably waiting us around the corner. When we look back, we wish that no surgical de decision had been made at the age of one year. Okay, to make a long story short, what would be the messages to take home? As we have reviewed together, we don't have a standard treatment prescription that can always be applied to every patient. We don't have to treat all congenitals, but if treatment is required, the method should be surgical. There is no lower age limit for surgery. The surgical method should be chosen according to the age of the child. In early onset scoliosis, if the problem involves a short segment, resection is our priority. We prefer the growth-friendly technique in long segment pathologies. For adolescent, adolescents, we treat adolescents with fusions after posterior instrumentation. The question is, shall we do an osteotomy? Answer would mostly be yes. If we do, what shall we do? Most of the time, posterior column and rib osteotomies are enough. In final words, congenital spinal deformities are difficult problems to handle, no doubt. Requires an experienced team, not good for a one-man show. If you don't feel competent, equipped, and ready to solve the problem, my suggestion, my two cents, not touching at all would be the most correct ethical 
and smart approach. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Professor Yazaj, for this excellent uh, lecture. You have enlightened us in an area which is very complicated for uh, most of us because we do not have your experience, sir. You have showed us um, excellent uh, cases. Your work speaks brilliantly for you. Uh, thank you for everything that uh, you have shown us. Uh, before starting to ask the questions from our participants, I would like to ask you uh, one question. Uh, Sorry, Edwin. Uh, Professor Muharrem, please, uh, can you stop your screen sharing so we can see each other? Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you. Uh, we have seen so much for us surgical treatment of this, of this disease. Uh, is there any place of conservative treatment in terms, in terms of bracing when treating these patients? Yeah, it's a good question. And I uh, try to briefly touch these topics. Maybe I can give uh, some more information about it. Uh, the brace treatment, uh, as you know, is based on the flexibility of the curve. And I mean, pushing this uh, the body from outside uh, to correcting the spine is the main, main philosophy behind of the brace treatment. As the congenital spine deformity is mainly includes uh, either bone formation abnormalities or bone fusion, uh, most of the time they are not uh, flexible curves. They cannot be handled by external forces. We use the brace or cast in some selected cases if, the, if they have a significant compensatory curve associated with the uh, main uh, congenital curves. Some of the congenital cases, for example, uh, the congenital anomalies we see in the thoracic area, but uh, in time, the children develop a significant compensatory curve in the lumbar area. And sometimes the compensatory curve is bigger than the main curve. In those cases, you can use brace, in those cases, you can use the cast under the general anesthesia to buy time to postpone the surgery. But uh, the full answer of your question for congenital anomaly cannot be handled by uh, the brace. Most of them, I'm not suggesting, I'm not uh, proposing the surgery for every single congenital cases, but if the deformity progressed, and reach the significant uh, degrees, the only solution would be as a surgery. Thank you. Thank you very much. As a working neurosurgeon in uh, Bulgaria, I like to share that I see a lot of patients who has really very small curve. And a lot of doctors tell to the mothers or fathers of the patients to wear braces, which are universal, and they uh, do not do anything. I think that we need some kind of European guidement for not for spine surgeons or neurosurgeons, for just for all the doctors to follow uh, some kind of indications for treatment. I think that this will be a good idea for most of the physicians in Europe. Definitely, definitely. Of course, uh, the, we have to uh, analyze first in the deformity type. I mean, idiopathic uh, scoliosis should be managed differently than congenital and congenital should be differently managed uh, by neuromuscular. But in general, in the growing child, if they have any deformity, deformity according to the SRS criteria is bigger than 10 degrees, should be followed up to maturity. This is the rule. And the, the other question, we have to uh, prescribe the brace every single patient or not, this is a different uh, topic, but uh, the take home message, every deformity, regardless the type or regardless the etiology uh, in growing spine, growing child should be followed up to uh, maturity. It doesn't mean every single pediatric deformity will progress. Some of them um, stay uh, same, it's not progressed, but, uh, Theoretically, we have to follow all of them up to maturity. And um, I have one more question. Which are the most common complications 
that you see with the surgical treatment of uh, these patients? Uh, luckily, not common, but maybe it's most uh, uh, devast devastating complication is neurology complications, including from the uh, transient uh, nerve paresis to paraplegia. And nowadays, uh, we are lucky, uh, lucky that, luckier than past because we have a good imaging uh, modality in our hands. We were able to evaluate our patients with MRI and CT and 3D modeling, and also with the help of uh, multimodal intraoperative neuromonitorization. Uh, we can follow their neurology during the surgery. But again, I think uh, the most important neurology, most important complication is neurologic one. And the other one, of course, the implant related complications and implant pullout or rod breakage or, or some other things, infections, um, pseudo arthrosis, all can, that can be seen, but uh, infection, implant-related complications, or surgery arthrosis, all this type of complication as a surgeon. Of course, we don't want to have any of them, but we can manage. But the neurology complication is the worst, and we are fearing the most, um, but luckily, we don't see too much in modern days because of um, good preoperative planning, preparation, and with the help of neuromonitorization. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. So I will uh, start to ask the questions from the chat part. Uh, I can read it. Yeah, I borrowed the message. Yeah, Dr. Soyuncu. Uh, the question is regarding the fixation after hemivertebral resection, how many levels do you prefer in short curves, one or two? And do you have any, any limits of implantation because of the bone quality? Do you prefer brace after invertebral resection? Uh, yes, and how long? Okay, uh, let's start from the last. Uh, I usually uh, use in the brace at least three to four months. It means we are expecting to get the fusion about in three to four weeks, uh, I'm sorry, months in small child. And if I'm not relying the kids, it's too, I mean, hyperactive. And in time by time, I'm still using the cast. And regarding the uh, instrumentation, type of instrumentation, I always use in the pedicle screw after the age of two because of the uh, new uh, implant system in the pediatric implant system, they have lots of uh, opportunity to uh, put the pedicle screw in the different size and the length. But in all cases, maybe you saw in my presentation, uh, we use routinely in the third rod in the middle. Uh, we put in the pedicle screw above and below, and we put in the hook above and below, most of the correction we are doing with the help of hooks. This is a two reason. One, uh, we are keeping, uh, we are just preserving the pedicle screw during the compression. Uh, all the compression comes from the hook. Um, pedicle screw is not loaded, one of the uh, good advantage. And also, if the skin coverage and soft tissue coverage allows us, we keep the third rod in, in addition. In those cases, if we get the correction from uh, hooks, it means we don't apply any compressive forces uh, around the, the pedicle screw. It means the pedicle screw is still very uh, strong, it's very good in place. And if we were able to keep in the third rod inside of the body, in those cases, I don't use the, uh, the cast, but other um, kids, if I felt my instrumentation is not strong enough, in those cases, I always use a cast or brace minimum four, three to four months. Regarding the first question, um, in the small child, I intend to limit my instrumentation in one segment above and one segment below. 
but in some situation this wouldn't be possible because uh, the deformity includes in the adjacent segments that's why my current protocol to i'm not suggesting defending to treat all hemivertebrae uh, regardless of the size but if the deformity is progressing i'm not waiting to uh, to uh, deformity reach in the 40 or 50 degrees i would like to intervene as early as possible one of the reason in small relatively small size deformities we were able to correct the deformity only one level instrumentation but if the case comes to you in the, the late ages in the late cases it's not possible in those cases you have to extend the instrumentation above and below it means you will sacrifice you sacrifices more segments this will be uh this will cause uh, morbidity in future and also negatively affect the spinal growth potential. This is my answer. Uh, hopefully, it was uh, good enough. Thank you. Thank okay. you. Another question from, I believe, in Georgia. Yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, Mario. Sorry. Uh, Edwin, did you, did you read the uh, thanks? From Hakan Karabalo, Professor Hakan Karabalo, and yeah, uh, okay. Did you read? Uh, no, 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 I, I couldn't. Read professor, I, I will read them. Yes, uh, because Professor Yazidji took my function. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Uh, so there is from Hakan Karabalo. Thank contribution. Thank you for your interesting and in a detailed presentation, Doctor Yazidji. And there is contribution from Madonna. Thank you very much uh, for your brilliant lecture and very useful advices. She's a Madonna neurosurgeon in is Georgia. A new neurosurgeon. Uh, he graduated uh, one week ago and became a neurosurgeon in Georgia. Uh, and Edwin, Mariam asked many questions. I think Mariam also a uh, moderator of uh, Ismail Online Neurosurgery. I think she can ask herself all the questions okay hello. you can unmute yes, yes. Can, you hear my voice? Yeah. Hello. can you hear my voice yes yes, yes perfect transport, sorry uh, so first of all uh thanks a lot for interesting presentation doctor it was really useful and necessary because Mariam, the time can you speak loudly because your voice is uh, low on the microphone yes yeah close the microphone Yes, one minute, so I will hear uh, my voice now. Yes, yes perfect. So uh, first of all, I wanted to thanks a lot because it was really interesting uh, presentation. And I can say that such kind of topics are really necessary for our society, not only medical, but to public to speak out about such kind of topics, because uh, in uh, our societies uh, exists stigma uh, with such kind of scoliosis and such kind of people uh, and uh, children who are born with scoliosis. And uh, I can speak out that parents are a little bit ashamed to show the children to their um, society and re really it's so big problem i think to the world not only one country but to the world and it will be really good to explain to parents how uh, they can treat such kind of babies and how can uh, how what kind of things they, uh, they can do with them also this is many psychological problems what the children has and um, i can speak about it so long so i have question two questions First of it uh, is that uh, do you have uh, when you uh, decide to operate such kind of uh, children and babies, what is the age preferable age to operate such kind of babies or it is absolutely individual and you are using here individualized medicine and second question. Is when you reject. Uh, and when you reject it to operate uh, such kind of cases, and what kind of cases was it, and can you describe any of them? Thanks. Thank you, Mariam. Thank Great. you, Mariam. Thank you. Thank you for your comments about uh, the 
public perception of uh, cursed, I mean, um, scoliotic uh, child. Yeah, you are really true. And some uh, countries still, uh, this kind of problems is being neglected. Uh, the people cannot reach uh, the good medical care and they have to live with kind of um, big problems and also public perception to them is not good. This is the very significant social problem. Let's go back to the medicine again. Uh, regarding the age, um, first of all, I must uh, highlight one thing. I'm not defending to treat all congenital deformities. This is very important. Some of the congenital deformities being incidentally uh, diagnosed in adult age, they didn't cause any significant problems in their function or uh, daily activities or uh, visceral organs function. But if the deformity is being a progress, I mean, if we have a documented progression, especially for the hemivertebra cases, in the hemivertebrae, I'm just uh, highlighting it because now we have an, a fantastic solution uh, for the hemivertebrae, just in taking out in the uh, malformed vertebrae to correct the spine and solve the problem lifelong. In these cases, I suggest to perform the surgery after the age of two. One of my close friends, Dr. Ahmed Alanai, uh, he gave a lecture in the States and a couple months ago, uh, he suggested to uh, operate the patients after the age of one. This is debatable, but I don't believe I'm not fully, this is a good friend, Ahmed is a very close friend of good friend of mine, but I'm not agree with him in this issue, in this matter. I still wait to age of two, but if we have documented progression, uh, we don't need to wait longer because on the age of two, in terms of uh, blood capacity, in terms of uh, cardiac reserve, uh, the kids are good enough to tolerate the surgery, at least in our hands. But in long sleeping curves, if the deformity includes more than uh, five segments, it means we cannot solve the, the problem with the short resection in those cases, in a different scenario, uh, in those cases, I still trying to postpone surgery as long as I can. I'm still suggesting the brace. Maybe this is a contradictory, as I told you before, because but the, I'm not expecting to control deformity with brace, just uh, keeping as is, and also giving some message to family. Your kids has a significant problem. You have you shouldn't uh, lose the contact with us. And in some cases, I still uh, using uh, reserve body cast or meta cast under the general anesthesia to postpone the surgery at least the age of five or six. I hope really I answer your first question. Second question, what is the contraindication or what is the uh, say no, uh, if I understand, understood correctly. From the deformity perspective, I think uh, we can do something for every uh, single deformity, even unneglected, even bizarre, but in the very, very significant contraindication such a complex surgery is pulmonary reserve. If the pulmonary reserve, because on the thoracic deformity includes the chest cavity and pulmonary function, if the pulmonary reserve is significantly deteriorated, it means force vital capacity about 20% or less, probably this patient is not really a good candidate for such a complex surgery. In those cases, maybe we can uh, suggest to uh, handle the deformity with Taylor gravity traction for long time, I mean, two months, three months, maybe longer. If we can, if we can get some correction with a continuous uh, stretching, and if we can help to improve her pulmonary function, then we can uh, schedule, we can uh, plan the surgery. 
but if the cardiopulmonary reserve not allows to perform such a complex surgery, unfortunately, uh, we have to say no. But from the deformity perspective, 100 degrees, 120 degrees, in all type of deformity, today we still have something to do. One other reason, a neurology complication, the question of Edwin in the beginning of Q&A session, Neurology complication is high in the congenital deformity, but if the patient already has significant neurology compromise before the surgery, postoperative neurology complication rate is significantly high. Therefore, if the patient's omit already paraplegic as a significant neurology compromise, um, you, you and family and patient should know there is a high risk of a complete neurologic deficit after the surgery. This is also a decision. I mean, uh, as while we are wanting, we are asking the, the bad, better we can lose in our hands. This is also another question. But real contraindication to me is pulmonary compromise. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. There's uh, a Edwin. I think we can uh, listen to people. First yeah. of all, uh, Professor Hakan Karabalı, and then Kadir Abul. Okay. Uh, if Please. Kadir Abul write uh, his affiliation, we can know him. Uh, okay, Hakan Karabalı. Uh, he is from Selçuk University, Konya Selçuk University, head of the uh, neurosurgery department. Uh, Dr. Yazıcı, thank you very much for your excellent presentation again. And secondly, thank you very much. Your English is very well, very understandable. Thank you very much. I have two comments. Uh, one of them, in the pediatric neurosurgery, we use these uh, words, prophylactic surgery. In the pediatric orthopedic surgery congenital for congenital deformity, we can say prophylactic surgery for the pediatric scoliosis, congenital scoliosis. Second uh, comment is about uh, associate anomalies. You touch this, uh, especially uh, uh, split cord malformation and tetrad cord malform, uh, tetrad cord syndrome and uh, lipomeningomyelo cell. Uh, before the uh, pediatric uh, congenital deformity before the surgery, uh, we should uh, treat uh, uh, firstly. Uh, question is, what is the, uh, do you have any optimum uh, time for first surgery for <laughs> pediatric congenital deformity? Okay, thank you for your um, comments and positive remarks, I appreciate it. Uh, regarding the question about in the uh, intraspinal associated intraspinal anomalies, uh, I just uh, briefly mentioned in my talk. This is a very uh, wide topic. Maybe in the future, one of the the future um, webinar, uh, we will discuss in detail. But uh, probably um, my approach or our approach is somehow different than your approach. Uh, the professor Nejat Akalan, uh, the pediatric neurosurgeons, is a, our close friend of us. We worked together for many years, and all together with the help of him, with the leadership of the him, we developed a policy. And uh, the we've been blamed uh, to be too brave at the beginning because we never touched the type two uh, split cord malformation, and we didn't uh, perform uh, neurosurgical intervention, even type one uh, split cord malformation, if the intraspinal anomaly is uh, beyond our instrumentation. But this is very um, hard topic and maybe we will discuss later. But regarding your question, if we plan to neurosurgical intervention uh, for our congenital deformity patients nowadays, at least last 10 years, we do in the same stage. Our uh, neurosurgical colleagues will remove uh, the vast spur 
or just release this um, uh, phylum or put the catheter inside of the syringa myelia. And then we followed with the neuromonitorization. If we can get in the nice uh, signal from the, the monitoring, uh, we will continue uh, to our procedure because we know that this is the safest and practical and also um, the, the best method for surgeons and patients as well. And the, from the surgeon's perspective, just one surgery to solve all problem. From the surgeon's perspective, if you schedule the neurosurgical procedure and orthopedics procedure in two different time, uh, it's very difficult to find in the landmarks because after the first surgery, because of scarring, uh, most of the landmarks is being um, not being seen uh, perfectly. Anyway, uh, my suggestion, my answer to your question, if we need neurosurgical intervention in our congenital deformities, my policy, our policy to perform in the both surgery in same stage under the intraoperative neuromonitorization. Thank you very much. Welcome. Thank you. And uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Karabao, for your comment. Uh, so I will continue with uh, Dr. Kadir Abu, who is Kadir from- Abu, uh, uh, can uh, talk himself, okay. I think, okay. uh, from Istanbul, Basakshir Finance Sakura City Hospital, orthopedic surgeon. Uh, hi, sir. I am from Istanbul. So I also shared a picture with you. Uh, I have a case uh, of uh, two years old. She is about two and a half, and uh, she has a congenital scoliosis with some refusions. Uh, in that cases, uh, do you uh, ever consider uh, cutting the uh, fusions between the ribs in spondylocostal dysostosis cases or some? Do you have any experience on that? Yeah, uh, thank you, Kader. Uh, first of all, I have some question about the spondylocostal dysostosis diagnosis because on spondylocostal dysostosis includes the, the, the ribs in both sides and also making the uh, chest cages narrower. This looks like in the typical congenital anomaly associated with the rib uh, fusion. Anyway, and the I see uh, you suggest you prefer to the cast application. I completely agree with you. This is the two eight two year and two year, two and a half year old girl in a long sweeping deformity. I think uh, this is the too early for, to perform surgery because in the surgery requires is a very long segment involvement. And the, I suggest I'm not expecting to get in the correction with this method. If the uh, test helps us to keep the deformity as is, to prevent the progression, this would be good enough to us. Anyway, and the, I agree with your treatment and the, I'm suggesting to repeat the cast application two, three, four times uh, when the child is tolerated. And then probably is a good option for this patient to put some kind of growth friendly instrumentation. The question at the time of the index surgery, when should we uh, open the chest and to expand the thorax? Uh, probably is a good idea, uh, but I have many cases like this. I put, uh, uh, I, I open the chest cage and simply cut on the, the fusion between the ribs and expand the thorax. This also automatically improve, uh, correct the spine deformity a little bit, but the, the bad news, uh, even you perform in the big, create a big gap between the uh, ribs, even you put in some Teflon mesh or kind of materials to, I mean, uh, rolling out uh, the, the ribs, a spontaneous fusion is being occurred again. You cannot keep the, the chest uh, cavity as free as uh, you perform in the index surgery. But anyway, I suggest to follow this patient with the cast uh, at least one, two, three years, uh, as long as possible. And then at the index surgery, 
I suggest to uh, perform an expansion thoracoplasty combined with the spine implant, uh, but I'm not expecting to keep the ribs away for a long time. I'm afraid a spontaneous uh, rib fusion will develop uh, soon after your surgery. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, I do not see any more questions uh, in the chat part. Professor Muharrem, as you uh, mentioned about uh, Najat Akalan, Professor Najat Akalan, and he was with us, uh, still he is. We, we want to hear from him some comments. Or... Uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, Muharrem, thank you very much. It has been a very nice talk. Um, of course, it's uh, a bit um, uh, different to the neurosurgical society, but we usually come together when a, a scoliosis uh, accompanies spinal cord pathology. I think that was the problem that uh, whenever we have a spinal pathology co coexisting with scoliosis, should we uh, touch it together or we should we do it before? Uh, our experience with uh, uh, Muharram. First of all, I, I must say that uh, I'm not a classical believer of tethering or a spinal congenital malformation that would ever uh, progress in the future. I think all spinal uh, pathologies from the neurosurgical uh, part uh, have uh, is, is stopped at the birth. So the child is already uh, born with a specific neurological disorder and he will keep it like that. Uh, growing would not uh, interfering to worsening neurology. So uh, generally I believe that I don't touch to spinal occult dystrophisms just for prophylaxis. Even though they have a neurological disorder, I don't think any intervention uh, would reverse it or even uh, worsen the situation if you touch a uh, balanced uh, abnormality. But in cases of uh, uh, scoliosis, as Muharram said, if the pathology is within the limits of the curve, that means that orthopedic surgeons needs, need to go up and down of the spinal uh, pathology, it's as why advisable that they do it with a neurosurgeon, uh, not untethering, but decompressing it uh, would be uh, enough. Uh, and th they can all be done in the same situation because of our uh, regular anesthesiology and monitoring techniques. We're not um, uh, doing it like 20, 50 years ago. Uh, the operation uh, time is quite uh, short now. The orthopedic surgeons are very well qualified. They can readily um, radiologically uh, uh, explain the uh, case beforehand. We have good monitoring techniques. So in a shortened uh, surgical time with a qualified orthopedic surgeon, I think all can be done uh, within the same period instead of two times um, um, anesthesiology or waiting for a waiting period, we usually do it uh, at the same period, uh, at the same uh, instant. So I think those are the uh, main points that I can uh, comment on. Otherwise, uh, what Muharram uh, has shown is quite uh, interesting and unfamiliar to me. I will, I will... <laughs> It's, it's, it's another world. I mean, uh, and it, it's frightening. <laughs> but I know that you guys are very, really, very really nice to doing it. And orthopedic surgeons had a great impact on neurosurgery as well, especially as you see, most of the spine surgeons are in adults, especially are um, neurosurgeons, which we have learned techniques from you. Thank you, Professor Akalan. It's uh, good to see you, at least in the, in the Zoom, uh -huh. with the help of Zoom. <laughs> yeah. Uh, 
Uh, Dr. Suju, maybe it will be an interesting uh, topic in the one of the future, uh, the webinar, uh, to combine with the neurosurgeons and the spine surgeon together to discuss particularly in this issue. This is still unsolved problem, unsolved question, still some controversy. As I told you in my presentation, the Chinese group, uh, some of the Chinese surgeons, um, they are so brave. They don't touch uh, even the spur uh, inside of the instrumentation. They reported very, very uh, good results, mm -hmm. but still some school suggesting to intervene. All MRI detected intraspinal pathology is in the two polar. Uh, maybe we can find the way in between. This would be one of the interesting topic for the future for especially young generation. Yeah, we should uh, arrange such a um, webinar. You are right, Professor. Okay, Edwin, I think. I think all finished. the questions are asked, uh, Professor Sujo. We uh, can make fi a final comment with you. I would like to thank you, Professor Mohamed Yazji once again. He is one of the most inspiring experts in spinal surgery, and we are proud of him in Turkey. Thank you. Thank you for giving me this opportunity again. Uh, hopefully, uh, we'll see each other in soon. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Professor. I also want to thank everyone who joined us today, this evening, this night. Thank you. Bye-bye.